All right, well, I think we'll restart um, on the hour. So uh, we're now moving into perspectives from psychiatry. Um, and uh, Quentin Dealey will, will speak now for about half an hour, about 30 minutes, and then we'll have uh, another 15 minutes for, for Q&A. And then um, we're going to move to, we're going to move straight after that to perspectives from history. And we'll be, then be able to hear from, um, from Eli Zaretsky with a similar 30 minute talk and, and Q&A. So we'll start with Quinton and it's great pleasure to introduce Quinton. He's a, he's a colleague. Uh, Quinton Dealey is a senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry. Uh, King's College London, where he chairs the Social and Cultural Neuroscience Group. He's a consultant neuropsychiatrist at the Maudsley and Bethlehem Hospitals. And Quinton is the chair of the Maudsley Philosophy Group. So over to you, Quinton. Thanks very much, uh, Gareth, for the introduction. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? Yeah, good. All right. So today I want to talk about uh, certainly perspectives on personality in uh, relation to this topic, but actually also what we can learn from psychiatry and other disciplines about this phenomenon of digital populism. So let's start with the topic of personality and with the observation that um, actually the character of politicians and its effect on their decision-making is a longstanding concern, in fact, of historians and journalists and biographers, um, not least at the present time in relation to the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. So in an article for The Guardian in June 2019 entitled, I was Boris Johnson's boss, he's utterly unfit to be prime minister. The journalist and historian Max Hastings, former editor of the Daily Telegraph and Evening Standard writes of Johnson on the eve of his election as leader of the Conservative Party by Tory MPs. Right, I've known Johnson since the 1980s when I edited the Daily Telegraph and he was our flamboyant Brussels correspondent I've argued for a decade that while he is a brilliant entertainer who made a popular maitre d' for London as its mayor, he's unfit for national office because it seems he cares for no interest save for his own fame and gratification. He continues, we can't predict what a Johnson government will do because its prospective leader has not got round to thinking about this, but his premiership will almost certainly reveal a contempt for rules, precedent, order and stability. He also adds, Almost the only people who think Johnson a nice guy are those who do not know him. As it is, the Johnson premiership could survive for three or four years, shambling from one embarrassment and debacle to another, of which Brexit may prove the least. So written before the COVID-19 pandemic, in retrospect, Hastings' predictions carry the weight of prophecy. In an article written on the 30th of May 2021 after the select committee evidence given by Dominic Cummings about the government response to the pandemic, uh, the political columnist Andrew Rawnsley writes in an article, Tories made a Faustian bargain when they gave us this Lord of Misrule. He writes, he painted an eviscerating incredible picture of a shambolic, cavalier, glib, narcissistic, reckless, contradictory, irrational, inept, indecisive, image-obsessed Prime Minister who changes his mind day after day. Like an out-of-control shopping trolley smashing from one side of the aisle to the other as officials try to get him to make vital decisions at critical points of the pandemic. Rawns Elias failings of the government's respond, response to the pandemic. Um, he says, we knew that he's a profoundly flawed personality manifestly unsuited to the management of a crisis of this type of magnitude. On the failure to accept expert advice to go into a second lockdown, he states, where his blame for earlier fading, failings might be widely spread, culpability for that avoidable tragedy lies sharply with Mr. Johnson. He is charged by the man who is his most senior aide at the time with being responsible for criminally bad decisions that led to many needless deaths. The most devastating accusation you can level against a prime minister. So perhaps corroboration of Rawnsley's analysis of Mr. Johnson's responsibility for avoidable COVID related deaths will be provided by a public inquiry when it finally convenes. But what is striking about the accounts of both Hastings and Rawnsley respectively is the centrality of their assessment of character to the decision-making and performance of politicians. This thing continues. <clears throat> 
In another article, accusations of lying pile up against Boris Johnson, does it matter, published in The Guardian. There's a discussion of the historian Anne Applebaum's book, Twilight of Democracy. Again, Johnson's personality is a focus of analysis. Numerous well-documented instances of lying are cited. And then it says, and then there was a Brexit referendum won, according to Applebaum, by lying, social media games, and brazen attempts to awaken English nationalism. Perhaps Johnson's deceptions mattered little, unless, of course, you're a wrong spouse. Wronged spouse. Now, though, his post-truth method has dangerous consequences for the future of democracy, she argued. So here the issue of uh, the character of a politician goes beyond competence. It's linked to a concern about a style of populist politics in the digital age where populism is understood as political activities or ideas that claim to promote the interests and opinions of ordinary people. But note here how these journalists are borrowing terms from the lexicon of psychopathology, particularly to do with notions of personality and its disorders. So let's take this opportunity now just to think more about what these concepts are and how they're used in psychiatry and psychology. So I'm going to share my screen now. So let's um, consider the concept of personality in the international classification of diseases. Uh, in actual fact, it's very similar in the Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual. I think the key point is that the individual's characteristic and enduring patterns of inner experience and behavior as a whole deviate markedly from the culturally expected and expected range, the norm. Such deviation must be manifest in more than one of the following areas. Then it goes on to talk about cognition, ways of perceiving and interpreting things, affectivity to do with the intensity and type of emotional arousal and response, control over impulses and the manner of, manner of relating to others and of handling interpersonal situations. Now, there are many types of personality disorder, but those which tend to be invoked most often in the context of politics relate to antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and the concept of psychopathy. So let's consider those in a little bit more detail. So in antisocial personality disorder, uh, the hallmark of that uh, really is uh, engagement in behavior that violates the rights and safety of other peoples. It involves engagement in illegal acts, deceitfulness, cunning, impulsivity, failure to plan ahead. It may also include callousness and lack of remorse. Narcissistic personality disorder um, includes features such as a lack of empathy, interpersonal exploitation, fantasies of unlimited success, the notion that the person should only associate with those of high status or institutions of high status, a sense of entitlement, arrogance and haughtiness, um, and reacting to, with rage to criticism and a need for admiration. Now the concept of uh, so, so these are antisocial and narcissistic personality disorders. And we also have this other construct um, of psychopathy, which the hallmark of which really is persistently antisocial behavior performed without guilt or empathy for victims. It's based on the classic description by the psychiatrist Harvey Cleckley in his book, The Mask of Sanity, originally published in the early 1940s. Uh, but this construct was operationalized subsequently by the Canadian psychologist Robert Hare in his Hare Psychopathy Checklist and its subsequent uh, revision. So the important thing to note about this uh, construct, uh, really, is that in some ways it's a kind of higher order personality construct which combines elements of different personality disorders. So uh, the, uh, the, the core of it is this emotion dysfunction, this shallow, this callousness uh, and lack of remorse uh, for violation of the rights of others. But it can also include this narcissistic component of this grandiose sense of self-worth. And of course, lack of empathy is part of the construct of, of um, psychopathy too. So I think one observation from a psychiatric perspective when thinking about how these concepts are used um, 
is that when the these diagnoses are assigned in clinical practice, personality disorders are typically accompanied by very high levels of distress and interpersonal dysfunction. Um, I should add, though, that uh, personality traits are dynamic in their expression and can change both with context and learning and indeed in certain circumstances with treatment and support. So when psychiatrists and psychologists think about these concepts, we're really thinking about their prototypic uses of disorders and particularly with these more antisocial constructs, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, that will often be within the setting of forensic psychiatry. Um, now, so therefore that means that the research that is conducted into these groups is in uh, well characterized groups in which there is a wide social consensus about the serious violation of social norms. It's typically linked to offending behavior and also linked to the assignment of these diagnoses, the role that the psychiatrist plays there is linked to well-established institutional management through the criminal justice system. And that feeds into research as well, because it's possible to stratif stratify the groups. It's possible to uh, delineate subtypes to conduct uh, research, both in terms of uh, phenotypic characteristics, underlying neurocognitive characteristics, risk assessment, um, and so on. And because it's, these are relatively well characterized groups, there's quite a good level of understanding of the presentation of the disorders within psychiatric in those specialized uh, settings. So then this raises the question whether these concepts can be applied to politicians. And I think there are definitely some uh, uh, difficulties or challenges here. So for a start, politicians are very hard to study uh, as a group. Um, there are much uh, 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 fewer politicians uh, than there are people flowing through the criminal justice system. Um, and indeed, they may, in the main, be much less motivated to uh, engage with uh, research uh, into personality structure. Um, there has been research into analogous groups such as high status decision makers in business and we have the concept uh, of so-called snakes in suits which indeed was a construct proposed by uh, Robert Hare himself. So uh, the idea there is that in actual fact within the business setting there are people with um, uh, psychopathic phenotypes. Um, I think a number of observations follow from this. The, there's a rather uh, complex body of research about this, but I think the main findings of that are that prototypic psychopathy, as it's uh, encountered in its most serious manifestations, does not appear to be associated with managerial success. Uh, but some people with psychopathic traits may occupy um, uh, positions of leadership. Uh, and the personality structure of so-called successful psychopaths may differ from those in prison. So we're confronted with a problem of how to study a hidden group to find out what distinguishes them. So this then raises the question, well, how can we use these contrasts? If we were as psychiatrists and psychologists to export these concepts into the political domain, how could that be done? Uh, and here again, there are a number of cautions, I think, uh, one, I think, is the risk of, uh, of category error and overreach as a concept is applied away from its prototypic uses. Uh, so, for example, one of the challenges is how to evaluate rhetoric and actions which affect millions of people in political decision makers, uh, where the consequences can be hard to trace and the value judgments about the behaviour of the person in question is shaped by political uh, orientation. Um, it's quite different from a law court. Uh, where there is a process for determining guilt and responsibility. I think another observation is as a society, we cede executive power to people who can make decisions that we can't. So uh, politicians make very uh, grave decisions which can cause enormous uh, suffering. But it doesn't mean that a po politician who makes those decisions is necessarily callous. They may appraise their actions as justified and also be removed from the consequences of the actions as well. I think an additional problem, uh, which is relates to the question of perspective, is that what to some counts as a disorder uh, may to a supporter be valued. Uh, so the, the concept of the application, the concept of disorder in politics is always likely to be contested. Um, is somebody a narcissistic bully? 
uh, or are they an alpha male uh, and a problem solver? Uh, so there is some scope for fundamental disagreement about particular instances or manifestations of imputed um, uh, dissocial or personality disordered behavior. So what is the solution for this? Well, what I would suggest is a move away from the binary question of whether politician, a politician has a personality disorder or not, to the question, what is their personality structure and what difference is it likely to make to their behavior under specific conditions? Now, this is in fact closer to what psychiatrists and psychologists do across the range of settings they normally inhabit. It's the difference between diagnosis and assessment and formulation. The other observation is to emphasize the importance of uh, what uh, sometimes called ideographic assessments of personality. In other words, it's a description of the unique characteristics of a single individual to understand what characteristics are present through time and what difference they make to behavior under specified uh, circumstances. And that ideographic approach is also sensitive to context and the social and financial standing and network of individuals, which alters opportunities, trajectories, and buffers accountability, for example. So the, the point here is that the differences which make a difference always do so within a larger context. And in fact, this is well understood by historians, political biographers, and journalists. Um, there is a particular issue for psychiatrists as well. It's the distinction which we were partly alluding to earlier between personality and persona. Uh, because politicians, uh, much of what they do, certainly in their public facing roles, uh, are occupying a role, uh, which is a strategic role enactment, uh, and doesn't necessarily uh, give information which can be taken at face value about their personality traits. So here, the method of the political biographer or the political journalist, which is to get the behind the scenes observations about the uh, functioning of the politician is absolutely critical. Um, and that is a potential pitfall for the psychiatrists or psychologists to be, if you like, to, uh, to take a strategic role enactment uh, at face value. Um, now, I would say that the, um, on this particular question of how to assess politicians, uh, the approach of Mary Trump, Donald Trump's niece, um, is, uh, I think, provides a good example of how this can be approached. It's a rather unique vantage point uh, she has in writing her fascinating book, Too Much and Never Enough. Uh, she's a highly qualified clinical psychologist who relies on her own observations and those of family members through time. Uh, and towards the beginning of the book, she writes, I've no problem in calling Donald a narcissist. He meets all nine criteria as outlined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5, but the label only gets us so far. Now, I, I would agree with this. So the, uh, and it, it reinforces the point really is to embed an under, the understanding of the person within their biographical uh, context. Uh, both uh, developmentally, but also present context to understand how their personality characteristics make a difference to their functioning with the concrete and, concrete and specific circumstances of their life. Um, but it's not just biographical context or immediate social context that needs to be understood. So Ariel Dorfman, in his article, A Taxonomy of Tyrants, emphasizes the importance of understanding political figures, such as autocratic strongmen, not only within their biographical setting, uh, but in terms of their political system, what he terms the historical specificity and distinct sociological circumstances of each case. So these circumstances at the present time now include the digital world of new media and its catalysis of populism and populist. So now what I want to do is explore this in the case of Donald Trump. Uh, and the digital, digital culture uh, surrounding him. So let's begin with the New York Times article of November the 2nd, 2019, entitled, In Trump's Twitter Feed, Conspiracy Mongers, Racists and Spies. This article analyzed Trump's interactions with Twitter since he took office, at that point comprising 11,000 tweets and hundreds of accounts he'd retweeted. Their comment 
By retweeting suspect accounts seemingly without regard for their identity or motives, he has lent credibility to white nationalists, anti-Muslim bigots and obscure QAnon adherents like VB Nationalist, an anonymous account that has promoted a hoax about top Democrats worshipping the devil and engaging in child sex trafficking. The conspiracy revives a version of the ancient anti-Semitic blood libel that in addition to molesting children, members of this group kill and eat their victims to extract a life extending chemical called adrenochrome. A progenitor belief was the Pizzagate conspiracy, which alleged that Mrs. Clinton and her cronies were operating a child sex trafficking ring out of the basement of a Washington DC pizza restaurant. QAnon has subsequently gone mainstream. In an article of May 27th, 2021, QAnon now is popular in US as some religions. A poll of the Public Religion Research Institute and the Interfaith Youth Corps, quotes, found that 15% of Americans say they think that the levers of power are controlled by a cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles, a core belief of QAnon supporters. The same share said it was true that American patriots may have to resort to violence to depose the pedophiles and restore the country's rightful order. 20% of respondents said they thought a biblical scale storm would soon sweep away these evil elites and restore the rightful rulers. 14% of Americans agreed with all three statements. And among Republicans only, that rises to roughly one in four. In an article entitled Reality Rebellion, the 1st of July, 2021, this year, the journalist Mark Danner notes that nearly half of Republicans told pollsters Trump was called by God to leave. Seven in 10 say the election was stolen and the current president is illegitimate. So why, we might reasonably ask, have these beliefs and related beliefs become so widespread so quickly? Several lines of theory and evidence are relevant to understanding what may be motivating such wide propagation of conspiracist beliefs. Conspiracy thinking is common in the general population and is defined as a tendency to provide explanations for important events that involve secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. Conspiracy theories are salient and motivating because they simultaneously evoke a sense of threat and reinforce group identity, the group, that is threatened by the conspiracy. In paranoid delusions, conspiracy, conspiracy thinking becomes self-focused. Delusions commonly involve the perception of organized attempts to harm the believer rather than malign explanations for public events that affect large numbers of people. So these conspiracist beliefs shared by large numbers of people are not delusional in the psychiatric sense precisely because they're normative for a group. Nevertheless, they share features with paranoid delusions in the detection of meaningful patterns and events in the attribution of hostile intent. Evidence implicates dysregulation and overactivity of the mesolimbic dopamine system in the onset of psychosis by assigning abnormal salience to ideas and perceptions. So working back from psychosis, this points to the role of the mesolimbic dopamine system in normal cognition, including political cognition. So the mesolimbic dopamine system is an arousal system which is activated by both rewarding and aversive stimuli. It tags cognitive and sensory stimuli as salient and promotes associative learning. It's also involved in attributions of harmful intent under ambiguous conditions. So Joe Barnby, in recent, uh, a PhD uh, student uh, in our group, has re in recently published work demonstrated that the dopamine blocker haloperidol reduced attributions of harmful intent in a so-called dictator game, where the participant has to interpret the intentions of a player. So this demonstrates involvement of the dopamine system in attributions of harmful intent, but actually it also points to how social conflict and stress, which potentiate arousal uh, system activation, are also associated with increased attributions of harmful intent. So ordinary social interaction is frequently emotionally arousing, but emotional arousal is also deliberately accentuated in cultural displays. And a line of social anthropological research originating in the work of Emil Durkheim has focused on how collective action and cultural displays serve to invest shared ideas with a heightened sense of reality, motivational force, and significance 
So this works through an orchestration of cognitive symbolic and sensory affective stimuli, and it has powerful cognitive effects, enhancing attention, emotion, memory formation, um, and partly by engaging arousal systems, including the, me the mesolimbic dopamine system. And also recent research by Sarah Charles, Robin Dunbar and colleagues also shows that the sense of social bonding arising from participation in communal action involves opioid transmitter release. So the use of ritual is not, of course, restricted to religion. Political rallies sample many of the same processes to motivate allegiance to the group and its ideas. In the case of new media, the internet has completely broken the link between spatial contiguity and collective cognition, whether that's applied to politics or any other field of communal activity. But of course, within this collective cognition of the internet, digitally mediated collective cognition, it still involves an orchestration of cognitive symbolic and sensory effective stimuli. And it still coordinates cognition amongst large numbers of people now spatially discontinuous or distributed. So if we accept that premise that we, uh, that this technology has uh, platformed a transition these processes into digital space, it still raises a question, well, what explains the conspiracist political content propagating through social media, and what many people now profess to believe? And here I'm going to discuss an example uh, from the work of the Oxford uh, social anthropologist, uh, Edwin Ardner, who conducted work uh, on the Nyong'o phenomenon, a particularly dreaded form of witchcraft amongst the Bakweri people of Western Cameroon, uh, which he conducted in the 1950s and 60s. And his research is interesting because he tracks the emergence and fluctuation of these beliefs within the colonial and post-colonial situation of the Bakweri over many decades. So this is the key belief. A person with Nyong'o was always prosperous, for he was a member of the witch association that had the power of causing its closest relatives even its children, to appear to die. But in truth, they were taken away to work for their witch masters on another mountain 60 or 70 miles to the north, Mount Kupe, in the territory of the Bukosi people. On Mount Kupe, the Nyong'o people were believed to have a town and all modern conveniences. Nyong'o people could best be recognized by their tin houses, which they'd been able to build with the zombie labor force of their dead relatives. How this belief grew up and by what processes the association of dying children and the ownership of tin houses became so, became so firmly fixed cannot easily be traced. But by 1953, the belief had taken such a hold that no one would build a modern house for fear of being possessed, of it possessing Nyong'o. So essentially let's consider um, this diagram here. So I'm just going to speak to this diagram here. So here we have in the 1950s, the phenomenon of Nyong'o. And one of uh, the point that Ardner made is that this particular type of zombie witchcraft uh, belief uh, was correlated with periods of adverse uh, social um, circumstances, uh, periods of economic and social uh, stress. Now, in actual fact, he records how during a period of improved prosperity when commercial banana farming was taken up, um, the Bakweri were able to afford a powerful witch association to dispel the witchcraft. And uh, the, uh, therefore the accusations went down. But during the 1960s, during a, another decline in fortunes, a new belief emerged that was somewhat similar. It was the idea that the elders in the village uh, warned people about picking up coins by the harbour because their Frenchmen might turn them into zombie labour to build the new harbour. Um, in the 1990s, there was a related form of this zombie witchcraft belief called Kong, uh, in which the zombie labour force was now uh, trafficked by the mafia from Mount Coupe. So the point that uh, Ardner makes, and of course he was focusing on the 1950s and 1960s, um, the point uh, that he makes uh, really, is how an underlying template of zombie witchcraft concept was manifested within particular um, specific concepts or expressions of that at different times. And he um, essentially 
drew a distinction from uh, linguistic theory from the time to distinguish between what he called P structures, the underlying concept of occult exploitation of the dead, and S structures, these surface instances. So what we would now call a cognitive schema or a cultural model, and these are particular expressions of that idea. And he also felt there were some historical traces of a probable pre-1850 uh, concept um, uh, of the uh, belief as well. So the key point here really is that the expression, first of all, it's the linkage of these ideas to uh, periods of social stress. And the fact also that there's a relationship between surface instances and an underlying structure. And the expression of the surface um, uh, belief also goes back to reinforce um, the underlying construct. Uh, the other observation that uh, Ardner made uh, was a fundamental notion uh, that misfortune was linked to an attribution of personal cause. Um, and as he uh, put it, if the schema or the peace structure changes to misfortune as an impersonal cause, witchcraft vanishes. In other words, if that key assumption is changed, the whole edifice of these ideas no longer become plausible or compelling. So how then does this help us to understand former President Trump's promotion of conspiracy theories as a political strategy? So I'm going to speak about five more minutes, uh, Gareth, just to finish the argument here. Well, the application of the concept of coalitional cognition to understanding paranoia and conspiracy theories in the work of uh, Nicola Rohani Vaughan Bell and Sam Wilkinson uh, helps. Because essentially what they show is how virtual communities can reproduce important characteristics of social influence and belief acquisition, although there are important differences. As they put it, an important feature of human social groups is the presence of coalitions. Any situation where two or more individuals unite in competition against a third party or parties, coalitionary conflict in human groups can manifest in the form of lethal aggression but can also include non-lethal and non-aggressive conflicts such as stigmatization, ostracism, exclusion, derogation. Coalitions are very easily formed. They say coalition boundaries in human groups are themselves highly fluid and flexible and can be formed in the absence of any stable group identifiers. The fact that coalitions can be formed on the basis of minimal cues or markers of similarity in turn selects a cognitive machinery that readily and flexibly categorizes people into groups on the basis of such minimal cues. Indeed, humans readily form and detect minimal groups, even from a young age, and the perception of these groups fundamentally alters expectations about the intentions and behavior of individuals within them. So from this perspective, online communities of the internet can be viewed as virtual coalitions with low entry requirements and a rapidly acquired sense of group membership and identity particularly where the identity markers are grounded on prior notions of identity, such as ethnicity or uh, political affiliation. So within this context, stimuli which are cognitively and emotionally salient win and are more likely to propagate. Amongst the most salient of stimuli are those evoking a sense of shared threat, as in the case of conspiracy theories. So this is the notion that explanations for important events involve secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. So in their book, The Web of Belief, the philosophers Quine and Ullian, in 1967 wrote, just about any hypothesis after all can be held unrefuted, no matter what, by making enough adjustments and other beliefs, though sometimes doing so requires madness. Social media and its users have arrived at a cognitive optimum for adjusting beliefs to maintain what would otherwise be regarded as bizarre beliefs, their reality rebellion. It's not psychosis in the psychiatric sense because the beliefs are widely shared and within their coalitional communities are normative and indeed enlist normal cognitive processes to produce extreme and rapidly evolving outcomes. This is by reproducing cult-like social and cognitive dynamics online. So it's more than an echo chamber and many processes converge. So first let's consider uh, these examples of conspiracy theories that have been propagated by Trump through his, through his Twitter uh, account. So the Bertha, Pizzagate, QAnon, 
voter fraud stolen election, the COVID hoax, the white replacement uh, thesis. So what happens, of course, is that by projecting these ideas, all of these ideas reinforce the underlying notion that there are secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. And a lot of these specific notions in themselves are not that important, but their importance is the reinforcement of the underlying schema. So the strategy is to reinforce conspiracism and therefore break trust in official institutions. So this is a schematic uh, from Nature News, uh, which shows the Twitter sphere. Um, uh, and this was uh, produced after accounts were shut off in an attempt to uh, suppress uh, propagation of the uh, QAnon conspiracy. But the main point I want to make here is just about the sheer volume and density and complexity of messaging and reciprocal messaging between these uh, communities. The, the volume of information exchange is enormous. So the other point that I want to make now is just spend a couple of minutes thinking through how uh, these digital communities on social media, they draw together multiple processes to intensify involvement and cognitive commitment. So this is the cognitive sweet spot, uh, so-called. It's a convergence of social, cognitive, and neurobiological processes that synergically interact. So at the cognitive level, we have the very notion of conspiracism, the use of narrative, imagery, sensory pageantry, the limitless scope for immersion within these worlds that you never really need to leave. The sense of permanent threat, the identity emergency, the persecutory and grievant thinking, which is relentlessly exchanged and propagated. And this is key. It's the relentless algorithmic reinforcement of key assumptions of the worldview, a totalizing vision, which is essentially self-confirming and immune to contradiction because any official counter narrative is disqualified because it's evidence of the conspiracy. We've neurocognitively, there's this relentless kindling of arousal systems, attentional capture, associative learning, patent attention, a heightened sense of meaning and significance and threat, and the effective rewards of coalitional bonding and exclusionary identi identities. Then, of course, we have with this phenomenon of runaway in even evolution really of these cognitive enclaves once you've gone inside them and, and uh, become absorbed and committed to them is the coalitional identity the social improvement and what Gillian was talking about this perceived agency participation choice empowerment the giving a voice in some sense to perhaps an illusion of agency and then these strategic factors the authoritative endorsement for political advantage by Trump or other elected officials okay. the role of hostile powers troll farms internal dissident actors. And where does this get us to? What's the result of all of this? Where are we now? Um, well, we could say that the net effect of this cognitively is to produce abnormally weighted or authoritative beliefs in technical jargon, priors, which influence appraisal, perception, belief. These are positive feedback loops. It's runaway evolution of this phenomenon. Um, and for those inside, it's an uncoupling from verifiable reality, a world of alternative facts, cult-like immersion at scale, and leading now to a crisis of democratic legitimacy and a real risk, a very high risk of political violence. So, what can we do about this? Trump's relentless kindling of anger, threat, conspiracy, paranoia, outrage, and grievance is central to his political strategy. It's the sine qua non of Trumpianism. He has no choice but to continue to foment a sense of crisis, of mistrust amongst his followers in order to galvanize political support. He has no other path to power or influence. So to, para to paraphrase Ardner, without conspiracism, Trumpianism vanishes. What then of the personality of Trump? His use of misinformation is purely strategic, whatever the costs. As he put it in a White House summit in July 2019 that quotes brought together far-right activists and provocateurs, Mr. Trump expressed appreciation for the fodder he sampled on Twitter. The crap that you think of, he said, is unbelievable. Trump has exposed and exploited vulnerabilities in American society and politics, 
and his unbounded readiness to do so reflects his personality structure. Too much, and never enough. So clearly these problems need to be addressed and I know that we're going to go on to uh, talk about that. But I thought that I'd just end with the observation that no system is infinitely buffered. And the distortions of communal identity and belief sweeping through digital communities. Recall the words of the Lebanese writer, Amin Malouf in his book on identity, written in what now already seems like another age, 1998, even though they remain relevant when transposed into this new environment. If people of all countries, of all conditions and faith, faiths can so easily be transformed into butchers, if fanatics of all kinds manage so easily to pass themselves off as defenders of identity, it's because the tribal concept of identity still prevalent all over the world facilitates such a distortion. It's a concept inherited from the conflicts of the past, and many of us would reject it if we examined it more closely, but we cling to it through habit, from lack of imagination or resignation, thus inadvertently contributing to the tragedies by which tomorrow we shall be genuinely shocked. Thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Um, so fascinating, dense, complex walk through cognitive neuroscience approaches to this and also um, um, anthropological. Um, so we've got about five minutes now for, for Q&A before we move to, um, to Eli. So are there any questions people want to feed in to the, uh, to the Q&A function? I mean, I thought just to start, Quinton, there was, it was very interesting how you were drawing our attention here to um, the interplay between character identity and, uh, and belief formation. So my understanding partly of what you were saying was that um, one has to really understand identity here as, as, a, as an important part of this, that once identity is fixed or, reinf or reinforced, those become these fixed priors in uh, the way in which we receive information and form beliefs. Yeah. Just don't shift off them. That every every new every new bit of information that comes in just gets interpreted in terms of the prior the prior identity. So I think uh, so I think that, it, that one school of thought opposes identity and belief as 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 saying that really what the effect of digital media or any other type of political persuasion um, it either influences identity or it influences belief. But I don't think they're opposed at all. I think they're interlinked. Uh, because, as you say, the assumption of an identity carries with it a, first of all, it places you in a group, and certainly within a conspiracy framework, by being a member of a group, you're also exposed to attack. So the appraisal of the world is linked to the fundamental identification with the group. Uh, the other point, of course, is that, uh, is that by virtue of membership of a group, it, 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 it then uh, exposes you to the traffic of ideas that belong to that group. Um, and so it's an entry point into a frame of, uh, of reference and meaning. Um, and of course, um, what, I mean, I, uh, you know, I would observe, I, I, I do think the actual scale and rapidity of the propagation of these beliefs is truly astonishing. And I think it indicates that we're into a new type of dynamic, uh, never anticipated actually by the inventors of the internet. You can't imagine Tim Berners-Lee uh, thinking that we would ever get to where we've got. So I do think the, the question of how this new technology and its gaming by people like, like Trump and others, nevertheless, how can it be so powerful in intensifying and shaping people's perceptions, ideas, self-appraisal, political motivations, and so on. And I think here, actually, I didn't go into it, but I think it, it's, it's, um, it's an important consideration. It speaks to the issue of identity, is the whole uh, concept 
of culture wars and identitarianism, uh, which is is the dominant frame of uh, of politics at, at present. Um, so uh, the uh, that I think is something that you know would be good for us to reflect on um, in the discussion uh, section se uh, session the plenary. Uh, you're you're silent at the moment, Gareth. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah, there's some. Thank you. There's some questions that are coming in now, but I think actually what we'll do is, uh, Eli, if you're ready, if we'll if we'll, we'll move on to your talk, and then there's going to be some time for Q and A after, and I think perhaps we'll be we'll be able to get a little bit more conversation, in exchange um, dialogue before before our second break. So Eli, um, so well, thank you very much, Quinton, and we'll come back obviously to this in in the plenary. Um, Eli, um, I'm going to just let people know a little bit about your background, if that's okay. So uh, Eli is joining us from Vermont uh, in the US. He's uh, a professor of history at the New School for Social Research in New York City. And his interests are in 20th century cultural history, the theory and history of capitalism, especially its social and cultural dimensions, and the history of the family. And his most recent book is is called Political Freud, uh, published by Cambridge University Press. So welcome, um, Eli, to speak to us. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for uh, the conference. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, mass psychology today. <clears throat> Since 2016, which witnessed both the Brexit referendum and the election of Trump, there has been renewed interest in what used to be termed mass or group psychology. In other words, the role of irrational forces in history. The reason for this is obvious. It's the collapse of faith in liberalism, which had taken a triumphalist turn after the collapse of communism in 1989. Do we have the intellectual tools we need to grapple with, these for, with the new forces? Mass psychology is one resource. By mass psychology, I mean the use of psychoanalysis to understand large scale group events or processes such as populism and especially fascism, which was historically closely tied to populism. In my view, there are three schools of mass psychology. First, there's a purely psychoanalytic school, which is largely Kleinian and which features such figures as Wilfred Bion and Otto Kernberg. The second is that of Frankfurt School critical theory and includes such figures as Eric Fromm, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse. Wilhelm Reich was not a member of the Frankfurt School, but his pioneering applications of Freud to politics and social theory inspired its efforts. Some key works of American social thought such as Richard Hofstadter's The Paranoid Style in American Politics, 1954, Christopher Lash's Culture of Narcissism, 1978, are not technically part of the Frankfurt School, but do continue its tradition. The third school of mass psychology is Lacanian and includes such figures as Juliet Mitchell, Slavo Žižek, and Ernesto Leclau. I'll speak mostly uh, about the second school, the Frankfurt School. The main context for understanding Freudian mass psychology is the overwhelming spread of capitalism, first under British and then American hegemony. By capitalism, I don't mean the market economy per se. Rather, I mean an historically specific social order akin to feudalism or uh, for some uh, plantation slavery. Contrary to Marx's hopes, the spread of capitalism did not usually produce revolutionary working classes. On the contrary, capitalism was ac accompanied by the mobilization of the masses, not just in the form of consumerism and mass culture, democracy, but also around such non-rational communal identities as nation, religion, and ethnicity. 
this created a problem both for liberalism and socialism. Liberalism was born in opposition to the new forms of mass politics that emerged with the English and French Revolution. Liberalism was animated by what Ernesto Leclau called the grand peur of the 19th century, fear of the crowd. As to socialism, to understand the effects of capitalism, the Frankfurt School developed such concepts as reification, commodification, and one-dimensional or administered societies, society. But such efforts ended in unresolvable unre antinomies. This was not the case with Freudian mass psychology, which rested on a theory of instinctual motivation that was not easily manipulated or administered. The need for mass psychology, mass psychology can be combined both with liberalism and with socialism. The need for mass psychology reflected the uneven development of capitalism. At one level, the spread of capital or value to use Marx's term, created a fungible temporally and spatially ordered life world coordinated through quantitative means, instrumental rationality, and abstract time, clock time. At a deeper level, however, as Freud argued, in the shift from the predominance of the pleasure principle to that of the reality principle, that is in infancy, one species of thought activity was, quote from Freud, split off, kept free from reality testing and remained subordinated to the pleasure principle alone, end quote. This activity was fantasizing, which always accompanies the rational transformation of reality. Rather than developing in a unilinear fashion then, the spread of capitalism was accompanied by a series of deremptions or sunderings, interruptions in the process by which the capitalist reality ego spread. These interruptions occurred along pre-existing lines of tension and established the regions in which newer identities and fantasies germinated. In general, we can identify three broad regions of fantasizing but as you'll see, they all have the same or similar psychic structure. The most important of these was the family, as in the famous haven in the heartless world, the protection of the family from the economy, the cult of true womanhood, Victorianism, social feminism was fundamental to 19th century capitalism. The new family in turn became the locus of the private public division and of a sexually based redefinition of individuality reflected in the 19th century in so-called primitivism in the visual arts, literature, music, dance, Jugendstil, Art Nouveau, which was the first really inter international art style in the, in, in the 19th century. So primitivism is a way of going back and establishing a realm of fantasy that continues the movement toward progress, rationality, and so forth, underlies. The second terrain of fantasizing arose out of the, is basically nationalism, arose out of the romantic response to the enlightenment, especially Herda which stressed the primordial identities of nations, languages, and peoples, another version of the unconscious. As the capitalist world system took, um, uh, took shape, nations mobilized what Tom Nairn called their inherited and unconscious powers to foster a compensatory sense of identity in a world of social comparison. Finally, the uneven development of capitalism played itself out in the colonial world in the form of the split between the material and technological side of modernity, which colonial countries embraced, and the spiritual or inner dimension, 
which supposedly came from Islam, Hinduism, Confucianism, uh, the Torah for the Jews, or some such traditions. So in all of these cases, family and sexuality, primitivism, nationalism, uh, the traditional culture, the struggle against colonialism, you have the inner world of the spirit contrasted to the supposedly superficial external world of reason, technolo technological rationality in, uh, uh, in the, and the ego. And these were the terrains in which the new forms of mass or populist group psychology emerged. The, ri the rise of fascism brought to the fore the differences between the Marxist theories of capitalism, which were the theories of fetishism and reification and Freudian mass psychology. From the liberal perspective, fascism was an irrational episode in that it did not follow from economic self-interest as liberal societies supposedly did. Ironically, the Marxist explanation of fascism as the superstructure of finance capitalism, Lenin, reinforced the liberal view of fascism as an irrational Sonderweg or unique path. Sonderweg being the term that was used to describe why Germany became Nazi. From the point of view of Freudian mass psychology, by contrast, rationality and irrationality were not so easily separated. Although in fascism, the preponderance had shifted toward the irrational, fascism could not be hived off as an outlier. Rather, fascism illuminated the irrational cross currents of all 20th century development, just as a seemingly incidental symptom, such as a nervous cough or tick, can illuminate the pathological structure of the unconscious mind. The heart of the difference between Marxism and Freudian mass psychology was that the central concept for the Marxist tradition was social class, while the central concept for mass psychology was the group. The crowd, as the group was originally called, had been one of the signal discoveries of the English and especially French revolutions. While crowds existed prior to the two revolutions, 1640, 40s and 1789, they did not challenge the, the existing system of authority. Rather, crowds affirmed it by seeking to restore traditional values. Often indeed, earlier crowds were led by nobles. The crowd of the French Revolution, by contrast, and the English Revolution too, was revolutionary and therefore for many irrational. As a result, the crowd forerunner to the group became identified with unconscious forces, especially mesmerism, animal magnetism, and with the power of suggestion, as it was called throughout the 19th century. The Paris Commune, 1871, reinforced the identification of the crowd and the unconscious and gave birth to the first systematic crowd psychology in the work of Hippolyte 10, and then, of course, Gustave Le Bon. Not surprisingly, the two world wars gave enormous impetus to the idea of mass psychology. World War I demonstrated, Zeev Stanhel has written, quote, the facility with which all strata of society could be mobilized in the service of collectivity. It showed the importance of unity of command, of authority, of leadership, of moral mobilization, of the education of the masses, and of propaganda as an instrument of power. America had never been a liberal country, but rather a democratic and even populist one. During World War I, how, during World War I however, it replaced Britain as the global avatar of liberalism in part because of its ability to mobilize and speak for mass or group psychology, notably nationalism, but more broadly in Wilson's phrase, self-determination as, as a group process. 
At the time of the First World War, the study of the crowd or group was considered by many social theorists to provide, quote, a surer portrait of natural man than any other human condition. The crowd, in other words, was comparable to what Hobbes called man in a state of nature. It was pre-social in a way. In a sense, Freud agreed. I'm now going to describe Freud's theory, which emerges during World War I. Freud agreed. He described the group as ultimately a recurrence of the primal horde, writing, quote from Freud, the psychology of groups is the oldest human psychology. What we have isolated as individual psychology by neglecting all traces of the group has only come into prominence out of the old group psychology by a gradual process, which may still perhaps be described as incomplete. Unlike his predecessors, Freud did not see groups as one sided the effects of groups as one-sidedly negative. True, groups lifted inhibitions and stifled critical thought, but they also inspired new ideals such as altruism and new creations, notably language. Freud's main objection to the prevailing group psychologies, such as Tens and Lebans and so forth, was that they failed to explain how groups affected their members. To explain this required a link between individual and group psychology. Making this link is what distinguishes Freud's approach to group psychology from, for example, social psychology, group dynamics, and other things, other areas of study, uh, study of groups. In the, uh, in the book, Freud begins his account, to, the book is called uh, Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego. So he's telling the story of how the ego develops. Uh, the ego starts with self-preservative instincts, which is sort of what liberalism starts with in Hobbes, uh, food and sex, but also with then with primary narcissism or the oneness of the early mother-infant relationship. This is Freud. As our egos develop, we relinquish the oceanic state but at the, at the same time, we also strive to recover it. And this is that peculiarly, peculiar temporality that I think is unique to Freudianism. The, the result is the creation of a mental a agency between the undifferentiated narcissism of infancy and the developed ego of the adult. This is the ego ideal. A group exists when a number of individuals have put one and the same object in the place of their ego ideal and have consequently identified themselves with one another in their ego. That's a quote from Freud. The group permits the creation of new libidinal ties among its members, as well as between each member and the leader. If there is one, you can have groups without a leader. These ties bypass the ego. They can even be transmitted by bodily means, what would later be recognized as projective identification. Groups, therefore, are repositories of illusion. They play the same role for the human species that dreams play for the individual. They are the vehicle of the illusion in that they promote change that is both projective and regressive. Quote from Freud, what man projects before him as his ideal is the substitute for the lost narcissism of his childhood in which he was his own ideal. We see this in the slogans of the two movements that sort of kicked off the modern populist era, take back control, go back to go forward and make America great again. They both show this regressive this is, I think, really where Freud makes his contribution. World War II was perhaps the high point of mass psychology, and not just because of fascism. Morale was one of the key words of the war. The goal was not parade ground efficiency, it's a quote, and obedience to officers, but a quasi-democratic group spirit. 
the Russians are mistaken to think that the social is something external and not an internal part of the individual, wrote one psychoanalyst. The social and cultural element is deeply ingrained in the individual and is to a large extent unconscious. Just as the infant must find his or her way to the breast beyond observed, so the adult must establish contact with the emotional life of the group. When Lacan visited England in 1947, what struck him above all were the British experiments with group psychology. With Dion and Rickman's experiments, Lacan claimed to have rediscovered the feeling of the miracle that accompanied the first of Freud's steps. As, as he later explained, this is Lacan, later explained, Dion deliberately constructed a group without a leader so as to force the group to take account of the difficulties of its own existence and to render it more and more transparent to itself. In America, the discovery of mass psychology led to a rethinking of liberalism. Historically, liberals assumed that economic interests determined the nature and content of politics. The reason was that the pursuit of economic interests was supposedly the essential component of rationality. With World War II, however, a series of horrors, the Soviet show trials, the Holocaust, and McCarthyism, especially for the Americans, erupted that could not be understood in terms of economics or rationality. McCarthyism in particular precipitated Hofstadter's famous article on the paranoid style, which Hofstadter defined as a sense of heated exaggeration, suspiciousness, and conspiratorial fantasy. Paranoia, some began to see, was baked into the liberal tradition through the original Whig uh, conviction that there was a corrupt and effeminate cabal at the peak of society, the monarchy and the Anglican church in terms of the origins of liberal thinking. This was the context that is 1940s and 50s um, in which the Frankfurt School historicized Freud. Freud, Adorno wrote, in 1951 foresaw the rise and nature of fascist mass movements in psychological terms. So Freud is not to, doesn't say anything about fascism or, or uh, it's in the background. His main contribution, Adorno explained, lay in exposing the psychological forces which result in the transformation of individuals into a mass. Fascist agitation deploys a systematic set of devices. This is Adorno's uh, reading of Freud, such as repetition, personalization, denigration of the outsider, which aims at creating libidinal ties that compensate for individual wounds. In Germany, these were the wounds of World War I or the long period of German insecurity that led up to the two world wars. But Germany was not unique. The problem of mass psychology, Adorno explained, is closely related to the psychological afflictions characteristic of an era which for social, socioeconomic reasons witnesses the decline of the individual and his subsequent uh, weakness. By historicizing Freud in this way, Frankfurt School thinkers also politicized him, criticizing Freud for not distinguishing between socialism which is a rational response to internal conflicts caused by socioeconomic change and fascism, which mobilizes and manipulates these conflicts. This speaks to the point I made to Jillian before the distinction between trust, which in the socialist tradition would not be trust, but solidarity um, and identification, which is unconscious and which you, you know, explains uh, fascism. The Frankfurt School also went beyond Freud in distinguishing the mass psychology of authoritarian societies from those of democratic societies. This required going beyond the theory of the Oedipus complex and emphasizing the mother infant or pre-Oedipal stage, something Freud was not fully able to do in 1921 because he had not yet formulated the pre-Oedipal Oedipal distinction. 
1921 when he wrote the group psychology book. In hierarchical societies, individuals seek a powerful leader or authority because their ego ideal, their ideal sense of themselves, enjoins obedience. In mass democratic societies, by contrast, individuals seek leaders with whom they identify in order to emphasize the equality of all members of society. The successful demagogue activates this feeling, but also relieves it by possessing the typical qualities of the individuals who follow him, but in what Adorno, quoting Freud, called a clearly marked and pure form that gives the impression of greater force and more freedom of libido. The leader completes the follower's self-image. The superman, Adorno wrote, has to resemble the follower and appear as his enlargement. This helps explain the phenomenon of the great little man, the R shucks, just folks, Yui Long type of demagogue. The democratic leader image seems to be the enlargement of the subject's own personality, a collective projection of himself rather than an image of the father. The fa fascist leader's startling symptoms of inferiority, his resemblance, this is Adorno, to ham actors and asocial psychopaths is an advantage, Adorno wrote. Often too, often the agitator's boasting is accompanied <clears throat> by hints at weakness, especially when appealing for monetary contributions. An example would be Trump selling steaks, wines, and college educations and go golf courses while running for president, showing his followers that he's like them but more. So let me conclude. It would be a real betrayal of the Freudian tradition to restrict its application to the right wing. Its deeper benefit could come from self-understanding on the part of the left. And if I had time, the 60s and the women's movement of the 70s and so forth, these are completely have to be understood as group or mass in mass psychological terms. <clears throat> Uh, of course, the application of psychoanalysis to left-wing politics was done to pathologize the left in the 60s, but this need not recover. I'll briefly mention three lines of thought which we can follow up. First, many of the dichotomies that the 60s and 70s left us with, such as culture and economics, identity and social class, recognition and redistribution, would look very different if we had a more complex understanding of individual psychology, which after all includes both narcissism, which is leads to the focus on recognition in uh, the political thinking that follows the 60s, and the ego, which is how we understand capitalism. Second, the point of Freud's theory was not to either validate or criticize groups, but to encourage the strength of the individual ego to resist group pressures. In, Fre in Freud's group theory, he talks about the first person who discovers uh, individuality and come is the, he calls the first epic poet, comes back and sings to the group about it. Uh, and one could see in the films of the of Adorno's era, the era in which mass psychology was most studied, such as Spartacus, the individual confronts a mob that is led by a tyrant, or the Oxbow incident where the individual stands up to a lynch mob, or the most famous 12 Angry Men, uh, in which an individual stands up to a jury that is that basically a mob. Um, we still need an understanding of the regressive pull of group processes uh, which is by no means restricted to the right. And finally, the experiences of the 1960s require us to think more deeply about the meaning of equality, which is the core value of the left. Adorno distinguished genuine egalitarianism based on collective processes of self-reflection from what he called repressive egalitarian, excuse me, repressive egalitarianism, quoting um, uh, Freud, uh, 
regressive egalitarianism recalls how loudly and implacably the demand, and this, this really speaks to the present, how loudly and implacably the demand for justice is put forward at school. If one cannot be the favorite oneself at all events, nobody else shall be the favorite. As these examples suggest, I don't think we're finished with mass psychology. Thank you, Eli. That's a <clears throat> fascinating historical perspective, but also the history of ideas, particularly the um, Freud's thinking on, on, on group psychology. Can I, I mean, there's, please, please put in questions now to the Q&A, um, questions which can, you know, address Eli's talk or even um, if people have had time to, to think about, to think about Quinton's. Um, can I start, Eli, by putting a question to you just about, you were keen to emphasize there that, you know, Freud no, Freud's notions of group psychology um, and thinking of historical instances where they have application is not you know, specific to the left or right, right. You know, what one, one can use them to understand, um, you know, political processes at a group level on both left, right. Can you just say a little bit more about that? that because that seems important to try to get us beyond some of the polarization that can occur. Right, right. well, that, um, that is important because you see um, the, um, the Cold War liberals, um, especially in America, I'm not, you do have this somewhat of this phenomenon, I would say Isaiah Berlin in, in England, uh, I would call him a Cold War liberal, uh, but in America, they're really, they're really dominant um, in the 40s and 50s. And this is the period when the Freudian influence um, is at its peak. And what they did is they pathologized uh, they politicized in a in a in a tendentious way uh, the whole um, meaning of mass psychology. So they took any formation of mass or group action as pathological, and they lumped together fascism and communism in the theory of totalitarianism, basically describing both of these as irrational mass. Uh, phenomena um, and uh, so forth, and they define liberalism uh, as an, in terms of individual rationality. And that leads directly to what we have today uh, in terms of polarization in the United States uh, between people like Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, who present themselves as, you know, rational uh, then they're not rational at all, uh, in my view, because rational, I would distinguish uh, reason in a philosophical sense from instrumental rationality of, uh, you know, means ends thinking. So they they do exemplify means ends thinking, but they don't exemplify reason, which would include a much deeper, more profound philosophical, historical understanding of our situation. Barack Obama, for example, didn't change at all, uh, the, you know, the irrationality of the war on terror or the irrationality that led to the financial crisis of uh, 2007, uh, even though his, uh, you know, his mode of action, you know, was definitely, uh, you know, not caught up in emotions and so forth. Uh, so liberalism set up this dichotomy between the rational individual and the irrational mass. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get away from that uh, by um, uh, going back to Freud's original um, apolitical understanding of groups and masses and so forth. And that means we need other criteria. We can't define, we can't say, we can't look at the uh, the Trump thing and just say it's just ir irrational mass and look at, let's say, the feminist movement or Black Lives Matter uh, and ignore its, you know, group thing. We have we need other 
criteria that we draw from political thought and so forth to say why, for example, we think that Black Lives, I think Black Lives Matter is a good thing and Trump is not a good thing, but it, they're both mass phenomena. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Yeah, no, thank you. So there's a question that's come in from um, Alice de Clare, who wants to take you back to the 12 Angry Men. Um, and the question is, how do we appraise the individual's need or desire to differentiate themselves from others, as opposed to the need to be part of a group? Well, um, that's, um, I would say that um, the need to differentiate oneself from a group, or the need to be part of a group, are um, both reflect uh, immersion in the group life. Um, so I would say that individuality uh, is a relation to the self, uh, but there is no such thing as a relation to the self that it doesn't require a certain independence from the group. But the independent, independence from the group, uh, I mean, we, there are very few phenomena in history. Uh, you have Newton. I was just teaching my my grandson uh, how Newton figured out the law of gravity during the play. He was completely isolated during the plague year. Um, and um, mysticism is an example of uh, of uh, an important phenomenon that is completely seems really requires separation. Uh, so these are, you know, these are very complicated. Um, these are all very complicated, nuanced things that we'd have to look at, you know, the concrete case and so forth. But the basic point is, and I mean, Freud is, is this is really fundamental to understanding the almost total lack of understanding of uh, Freud and psychoanalysis that prevails in our culture today for important historical reasons, huge suppression, huge repression of knowledge, in my view, in the last 50 years or so. But I think one thing that is really important in understanding Freud is, um, you know, uh, basically our psychology is group psychology. Uh, and what we call in individual is very, very important. It, it, it is not group psychology in embracing the group the way fascism does or communism, uh, but rather uh, uh, embracing a kind of individuality that has a relationship to groups. Can I follow up a little bit on that? And um, I mean, your, your interest in group psychology suggests that there are forms of, of political group psychology which can be healthy rather than uh, absolutely rather than extremely absolutely. unhealthy absolutely and um so that would suggest that um a, that there is a notion of populism in in politics which isn't necessarily unhealthy that that right. um, you know as you said the liberals of old who who've wanted to pathologize that you you're right. wanting to put you're wanting to push against that right so what would be the healthy forms of, I mean, we'll probably get onto this in the plenary a bit more, but can you give us a taster of your sense of the healthy forms of, of political? Well, I mean, I think that what happened in the 60s um, had two, um, well, first of all, um, Freud himself distinguishes organized and disorganized groups. So you have things like trade union movements, the whole, whole uh, uh, movements for, you know, social reform and so forth are based on not only group activity in the sense of demonstrations and political organization and so forth, but a recognition of collective, that we are collective, that, you know, against, you know, the lone horsemen and so forth. Um, you know, this uh, groups empower um, self-affirmation. Uh, and you see that uh, in the civil rights movement. Uh, and then the new left, um, uh, Kristen Ross wrote a really interesting book about 1968, um, where she says the, the group processes and, and, and 68, you know, the peace marches, beings, communes, uh, 
drugs. It's all about the dissolution of the individual and the merger of the individual, sexual revolution of the, you know, um, uh, all about the crowd, the group, and so forth. She says this was a shedding of social determination uh, in the search maybe uh, for a broader way to identify one of the things that really comes across uh, when you study the 60s is this struggle to identify with, with the Vietnamese, with the peasants to break out of national frames and so forth. It's not a student movement at all. Uh, that's, but that's a group, for, that, that, that's done by groups that in groups, you shed your identity and um, uh, the, 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 there's something going on. It's hard to specify in the new left. And then very definitely the women's movement is all about uh, creation of a new kind of group, which is groups of women, groups that are based on our identities as mothers and sisters and rediscovering what it is. And exclusion of men is fundamental to that as all groups have inclusion and exclusion. So those are all very, I think basically very trade union movements, civil rights movements, student movement, women's movement. These are all, they're, they're all positive, but it doesn't mean that we can't understand them as having uh, an unconscious uh, dimension and having negative aspects. Eli, <laughs> Gareth, could I ask yeah. a so uh, that's very interesting. I've just got a, a, a couple of questions really. One is the idea, say we think about these online communities or groups that form now, so people who uh, identify with a Q, a non-conspiracy, or those who think the election is stolen and so on. Um, it, it, as far as I understand, they actually cut across quite a large swathe of the population. And so it raises a question, what do these people share in common? Because actually many of them will not be from the same socioeconomic background. Right. Um, so it, therefore, um, I, I suppose one part of this question is what's the role of social class and if you like social suffering or exclusion or marginalization in defining what counts as a group, because actually you can be part of a group and not uh, have, a, have any of those characteristics at all. There are very many well powerful, um, well off Americans who identify with these ideas. And then the other question is, what's the, what's the importance of physical proximity to the psychology of the crowd? Because, of course, the whole point about these digital communities is that people are spatially separated, but uh, nevertheless enter into collective cognition or some kind of collective identification. I mean, that may, in some sense, be privately constructed. And, you know, there's an interesting question as to what the phenomenology of that and actually what how that is the same or different from being with 100,000 people in the same space. So those are two questions. Uh, what difference does digital community make to your approach? And what difference does social class differences make to your approach? Yeah, thank you. Those are both very um, you know, good and helpful. Um, Questions. Let me start with um, with the latter question uh, about physical proximity and the digital and so forth. Um, you know, I, I don't have a simple uh, answer to it, um, but a couple of uh, observations. I think um, Canetti's book *Crowds in Power* uh, is a very difficult book, and I, I can't say I've ever really been able to read it from beginning to end. But I keep looking at it and so forth. Um, he, um, that is a non-Freudian, I would say very anti-Freudian um, approach to crowds, but it's very interesting. Um, and he says the sort of the most basic fear is the fear of being touched from an unknown space. And, you know, you see how important this is 
to the two great um, mass movements of our time in the, in the US, Black Lives Matter and Me Too. They're both about being intruded on, into. They're both about physical, so they're both touch is very, obviously Me Too. Um, and, uh, but that's also the case with the, uh, uh, with police invading space and so forth. Um, so, um, I don't, um, I don't have a theory about it, but I do, I, I do think that, uh, that, uh, I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't just say a crowd is a crowd, whether or not it be a crowd gathered in a public space or a crowd on the media. Yes, those are both crowds. Uh, I do think that uh, the digital has to be understood in mass psychological terms. They are, these are definitely, the, the digital works totally by processes of creating identities and creating differences and grouping people. And obviously the algorithms work this way to group people uh, by uh, similarities and sharpen, uh, sharpen those similarities and sharpen differences uh, and so forth. So those are, uh, those are groups. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I also thought that um, Jillian's observation about this morning um, about her children and the internet and so forth was very interesting in this respect. Um, because she raised also the question of spatial contiguity. Um, and um, I think a book that is one of my favorite books and that is very relevant here is Michael Balin's book, Thrills and Delights, uh, where he distinguishes two basic, you know, sort of uh, extremes that everybody sort of has elements of and so forth, empty spaces and clinging and touching and holding on to things with his very little empty space uh, and uh, so forth. And I think that that can be applied to, um, you know, this, the question of how to, how to think about groups, uh, whether digitally or in physical proximity and so forth. So those are just some, those are random, those are some mm -hmm. random observations. I don't really have a theory about it. Um, and- yeah. uh, should we reach out and touch Peter digitally? Peter, do you uh, want to? Wait a minute. Uh, 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 Quentin had uh, the first quote. What was the first question? Uh, social class differences. Yeah, in social class. Group. Well, I mean, that's just so obvious that, uh, you know, the Marxists all assume that, uh, and I, I mean, I'm still a Marxist. I mean, I, I, you know, I still believe that uh, we have to think in terms of capitalism and so forth, but the uh, earlier Marxists thought that you had to explain fascism in terms of, uh, you know, the working class would never support uh, Hitler and so forth. And this was obviously false. So obviously the unities that create groups uh, cannot be reduced to classes, but that doesn't mean that they don't have social determinants or social aspects to them. Yeah. So Peter, okay, go on. Thank you very much for those two amazing presentations. Um, I just had a quick question, actually. I was wondering whether you could, you, you mentioned that Freud developed his theories in the First World War. Um, I just wondered what, what was the role then of what he saw in the First World War on that development? And was there, you know, obviously it's the time when you see mass, mass propaganda used probably for the first time in the way we understand it today. Um, and so would he have been starting off from a point of view that, that it was, that it, you know, the negative side of group, group psychology? Well, um, you know, tracing uh, the effect of World War I on Freud's uh, thinking is, is very, very complex and to a great degree uh, speculative. Uh, but his two examples of group psychology in the book on group psychology is published, I think, 1920 or something like that. Um, and his two examples are the church and the army. And a lot, a lot of his examples come out of the army. And I, I, I guess he had two children in the army uh, and, and uh, so forth. So he's very concerned with camaraderie among uh, members of a group and, uh, you know, uh, so forth, and you know, 
hierarchical, all male, all male uh, group formations, both the church, because he was concerned with the Catholic church. Um, and um, uh, the other thing about World War I was shell shock uh, and the broken nature of the soldiers, uh, which made him rethink his whole theory of the unconscious and leads to the theory of the ego. So the theory of the ego is inseparable from his theory of, the, of groups. And as I say, that is really what distinguishes Freud's approach to groups from um, all the other forms of social psychology. And so they don't have a theory of individual psychology or their theories are extremely primitive, such as like likes like, or tribalism or something like that. That's about as primitive as a Marxist theory that the workers will never support a, a, a fascist. Um, but he has a very you know, complex theory of individuals and how they develop and the particular moment in their development at which their identifications are most labile and most uh, you know, connective and when they most need and connect to both well, all sorts of identifications, but especially for our purposes, groups. Uh, and that's the moment of the ego ideal, that not the superego, not the ego, not primary narcissism, primitive narcissism, primary, not self-preservation. See, Hobbes says the crucial thing is self-preservation. What The reason we need a government is because we all need security and we disagree about everything else. But the one thing that will make us into a, a group, a, a society, a Leviathan, is that we all have to preserve ourselves. Um, and Freud against that is saying what makes us into group beings, what really holds us together are our is our primary narcissism, our wish to reinstate the um, sense of self-love and triumph and so forth that we had in infancy. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Quentin and Eli, and for, I think we're warming up in terms of the dialogue now for the plenary. But we deserve a break and a stretch. I think we need to have a stretch, a bit of a refresh. Uh, we, we're over a little bit. So what I suggest, but not too much, but I suggest we um, we we regroup it um, at 10 to the hour. So at, um, uh, at 4.50 or in, or, or in the US, that would be what, 11, 11.50, Eli? So we'll see you then, 10 to the hour after a break.